Everyone, this is actually a special ec epic, epic book review with Judy Casas. You like the classical music? It's amazing, George. I never knew you were quite so cultured as a Canadian, uh, but now. Hey, I hey, well, I know you're a big culture guy, so I just had to play that for you. Hey, so we got Jimmy on the podcast today. We're recording this on a Saturday, and we're going to talk Culturized, which was actually written in 2017. And before we kind of get into the book, I remember I, when I, I read it before anyone else did. Like, not anybody else, but before it was out to the general public. But I remember reading it and just being blown away. Uh, and I, I, I remember, I think I said this to you, it felt like the, the good to great, ver like the education version of good to great. Like, it was, good to great is one of my favorite books uh, ever on leadership. And I thought you just did. And it, it, there's just so many parallels to that and I, I feel like you just did such an amazing job really your concepts your ideas um in culture now before i i, I should say i now before before i i gotta tell the story about jimmy before we get into this <laughs> so we have this uh i went to I'm, i don't know you remember the story that i'm gonna tell the hat story do you know the hat story you remember this oh yeah do you know? okay so i'm I love Jimmy's work. He's an amazing educational leader. And I saw it in, and there's this one moment where a lot of it just said a lot to me. And um, I was in Jimmy's school and I saw a kid walking by. And I know he had like, there's like a no hot hat policy in your school. I remember this. And I'll, I remember someone, I don't know if it was a teacher, adult, whatever. And a kid was walking by and they said, they snapped their fingers in hat and the kid kind of looked mad, reluctantly took off his hat and then, and then looks back at the adult and then is like, sees that they're gone, hat right back on. I'll never forget. So I'm just sitting there watching all of this happen. And then you come up and you're like, dude, why are you wearing a hat? If I had hair like yours, I would never wear a hat. I would be, and and it's funny because you never even said to the kid to take off their hat, and the kid takes off their hat. You have this amazing interaction, made the kid feel like a million bucks, and then and then wears hat again. And I just rem I remember that. I'm like, that's that's how you deal with people. And do you remember that at all? Like, I just yeah. remember. I was just like, that was just. And I'm watching both of these interactions. I'm like, that's just such a powerful way to you know to deal with kids because it wasn't. You got your point across, but you just did it in such a, a way to really honor the kid. You're kind of joking, but do you remember that? I remember it, and I actually can even tell you exactly where it happened because we had walked out of the main office, and we had turned mm -hmm. left. There's a foyer there, and we were walking from the foyer into the library when that student came out of the library, and that's when that interaction happened. And uh, But what I thought you were going to talk about, George, in Culturize, I talked about a student named Ben, right? The kid who yeah. we take back into school after... Uh, basically flunking out, flunking out, flunking out. And, and uh, he's back and he wants one more chance, right? He's 19 years yeah. old. He's, you know, and, um, and basically I just meet with him and I'm trying to understand, you know, what is different this time? What's going to be different this time, Ben? And I remember looking out in the main office and there it is, right? A young girl with a young baby. I'm like, oh, yeah. now he's a dad, right? Right. And I remember saying to Ben, Ben, listen, I'm going to give you this opportunity, but you need to promise me you're going to get it done. And he goes, Mr. Cost, I promise you I will get it done. I said, well, I want it in writing. So I slid it over to him. I said, I want you to write in writing that you are not going to mess this up. <laughs> I said, Benny, you need to know why, buddy. I said, because we need the Bens of the world giving us hope yeah. that we can get every kid across that stage. And I need you to do that. Because if not, there's going to be another kid after you that's going to want a chance to. And I'm going to say, mm, I don't think it's ever going to happen, right? But if mm. you do it, then you leave your legacy is that you create hope for others. So I need you to do it. Do not let me down. I will be so upset at you, Ben, if you mess this right. up. Mr. Costa, don't worry. He takes a piece of paper. He writes it down. He slides it over me. He says, thank you. Stands up, shakes my hand. goes, I promise, Mr. Costa, I will not let you down. And he walks out of the office. And I looked down, I grabbed the piece of paper, I opened it up, he had folded, I opened it up and says, consider this an invitation to my graduation party. 
Oh. oh my god! I just freaking wanted to cry that moment. I said, "Dude, I I checked on that dude every freaking day, George, to make sure That's he awesome. did it." And we had a banquet that spring, and he actually, um, at that banquet, he was being recognized for persevering through very difficult times. And he got up and gave this awesome talk. And of course, he talked about me and how I gave him an opportunity and how he thanked me. For it. it was it was it was awesome. He just freaking made me cry that night. But uh, anyway, but. My point is this, if you remember, George, that had happened prior to your arrival and you were staying at the Hilton Garden Inn there in Bettendorf yes. and we went to the Hilton Garden Inn. I took you to the, to the hotel. Yep. You're like, oh, I can go. I said, no, I'll take you over there. And if you remember, we walked in, we were waiting at the desk and then the guy comes out of the back room and it's Ben. Remember, he just <laughs> runs around and he gives me a big hug. You're like, what the hell is going on? I go, George, you don't right. understand. This is my this is my boy, right? That's ben nice. was working at the Hilton Garden Inn, so... <laughs> It was crazy. That's I hadn't awesome. seen it for a couple of years and he's just sitting there working. So small work. Those little, those little interactions uh just, just mean everything. And it's you know, I know how close you are to your family and how close I am. And it's like we, we learn so much of the stuff from our parents, right? And we interact, even though none of them were educators, but there's so many things that we learned in hospitality, how they connect with people and really, really powerful. So before we get into the book, it was first published in 2017. Uh, Jimmy has I know you're working on a new book called the Interview interview chair um but also um you know anyone listening i think this is and you can go, you can go to this from anywhere in north america it's open to everyone but i think it's actually being held uh in chicago you do have a workshop on hiring for excellence uh, especially for the administrators obviously listening to this po podcast can you tell us a little bit about that when it is what you're doing that day maybe connection to your yeah. new book that's coming out yeah, I'm putting on a two-day workshop, George, in Chicago, Illinois, on October 24th and 25th. And really, it's just, it's a reminder, right? As I always say, remind me what that class was called in principal school that taught us how to hire right. for, you know? And of course, <laughs> we never had that class. And yet, my worry is, like me, is we basically leave it to chance. And it's not really mm -hmm. fair. And for every miss that we have in a, in a, in a selection of a candidate who we hire, that's not good for our culture, not good for our morale, certainly not good for our kids. And so we need to do better and uh, because it's very costly, right, in so many ways, whether it's resources or time um, or even having to remove a teacher that's not good for kids. It's it's never good for our culture. But this is a little different, George, because it's more about when we're hiring, how do we how do we impact our existing culture, our current culture? And so this workshop is more about how we influence our current culture and elevate that culture during the hiring process to model a process by using a framework. And the idea is this, that if you interview three people and you're looking for one position or one candidate, that means two people are not going to get the job. And so the mindset is this, but what will those two people say about their experience with us when they walk out? Will they say, God, I wanted to work in that school. God, I want to work yeah. for that. School. God, I want to work for that staff. Because yeah. if they did that, that means our process, we left an impression on someone that they carry the banner for us, even though we didn't hire them. And that's the idea. Like, how do we create these experiences for people? It's almost like a wow factor, like, wow, right? Like we create this experience. And so, so that's what this workshop's about. It's to give people a framework for hiring for excellence, a proven framework, by the way. But people are also going to get resources. And not only is it about hiring, but how do we retain these people? How do we onboard these people? And so how do we make sure that when we hire them, they're great? But how do we keep them great? And so they don't lose their way and fall back to average. And, you know, five years later, we're saying they should have retired by now. So anyway, that's the premise of the workshop. And hopefully people like it. So, And so if you are interested in that, you can actually see it in the link in the description down below. The The thing that really resonated with me, and this is something uh, that mattered to me when we would when I would do those interviews and same thing, you know, you hire one, you, you don't hire, you know, two, three other people. Uh, in the response to those people, I wanted to make sure that I gave them really good feedback, really help them. Uh, and you know that they might not get a job with you as well, but they're getting a job somewhere else at some point and they're going to be working with kids. And if they're going to be working with kids, you want to put them in a situation where they're successful. And I remember actually someone not getting a job with me and basically saying my feedback helped them so much that they were so grateful that they help them get their next job and that they had, you know, a lot of success at the beginning of their career because of some of the feedback I said to them. And, you know, as someone who works with people, I sometimes I can't believe 
that school districts they'll ask you to do something and you know it doesn't work out and you just never hear from them and it's like that's seriously right. like that's mentality like that that's really that's really weird um so again the description down below you know as long as benny the bull is not there who is my arch <laughs> enemy <laughs> You Benny still, the Bull. You still have trauma from Benny the Bull, don't you, George? Benny the Did Bull. You see how when I went to the me. game, I sent you a picture of Benny the Bull, and it triggered that that memory. Benny the Bull. I I'm not a fan. Benny the Bull. Listen, when I went with Jimmy, Jimmy took me to a Chicago Bulls game. <laughs> Benny the Bull, a gigantic bag of popcorn. This is not why I, I don't like Benny the Bull. Two other games I've been to Chicago. Out of twenty thousand fans, he dumped popcorn on me. It's like he knows who I am. <laughs> do you not do you know this? Like he actually found me you too. It happened again. I couldn't believe it. Like, How is yeah. this guy coming after me? And it's like that's that's that does to one person at a game. So <laughs> I, I'm like, so Benny the Bull, Benny the Bull, and I got some beef, but other than that, and so check out the description down below. All right, so let's get back um to culturize. I got three questions for you, and you know, this was written in 2017. So when you actually think about when you first wrote Culturize, what was the what was the thinking on why you wanted to write this book in the first place? Yeah, there were a couple of reasons, George. The first I would say is, um, so I took my first principalship at 26 and by 38, I'd kind of lost my way. I was kind of just tired mm -hmm. and frustrated and and quite frankly, just really disappointed in people because I couldn't understand, you know, why are people working in schools and all have kids, right? And, right. And so when you lose your way, which is what I call it, right? You lose your passion and your fire and you're just kind of checking the box. You don't really think it matters anymore. More. You don't think you're making a difference. You start doubting, right? You start doubting it. And, and so I kind of lost my way and I was ready to leave the profession, to be honest with you, George. And um, I remember meeting up with my mentors in Milwaukee where I'd started my career and and uh, my first uh, boss that gave me a job said, hey, Jimmy, what happened to the young man that sat in that interview chair who wanted mm -hmm. to come to the inner city to change the world? What, what happened to that young man? And, and the truth of the matter is I just lost my way. Like I was a shell of that person, right? Mm -hmm. It's a reminder what this job can do to you if you're not careful, right? And the reason is, is because there's so much emotion in it. There's an emotional toll, I believe, that what happens to us when we're trying to make a difference with kids, when we see their potential, and quite frankly, when we feel we let them down, when we fail them, right? When they don't reach their full potential. Because as adults, we have this experience to know what happens when a child isn't educated, right? It's like they're, they're just gonna get stuck in a, in a, in a generational you know, poverty, right? They're, they're never gonna have the potential necessarily to have the quality of life that they so desperately want. But again, I know there's statistics that says, yeah, there, it could happen, I know. But the statistics is weighed heavily against them, right? So yeah. anyway, so the bottom line is um, when I lost my way, uh, with their help, the guidance of three awesome mentors, they helped me see it differently. And one of the things they asked me, George, is like, Jimmy, so when you like walk into school every day, like where do you draw your leadership from? Like where does it come from? And I was like, well, what do you mean? I was like, I just walk into school every day. I work really hard and I want to make a difference. And you know, I just try to be a servant leader. And they're like, I know, but where do you draw it from? Like, what what do you value most of everything you do? And it was really weird because it was confusing me a little bit. And, mm -hmm. and so then I realized that what they were really asking me really later, I figured it out, was well, what's my leadership language? Like, where do I lead from? Because that leadership language is important because it brings clarity to people in terms of what you expect from them. And so they helped me develop a framework for behavior, not for the kids or the staff, but for me, like develop a framework. Mm -hmm. And George, that's actually when I wrote down those four core premises of Culturize, right? To be a champion for kids, to expect excellence, to carry the banner, and to be a merchant of hope. The first one was dedicated to my assistant principal, Kelly Morgan, that I write about in Culturize. That, he was my champion, right? So that's where that value comes from. To expect excellence, that's my parents. And it's also carry the banner because my parents created experiences for people that when they walk away, they would carry the banner for my parents. They'd carry their banner for their food, for the restaurant, for the way they connected with people. And the mm -hmm. idea of being a merchant of hope was just, that's what I wanted to do. I want to be a merchant of hope for kids. I want to say, hey, don't ever give up. Don't ever quit. You can do this, right? So those four core values is a framework. It's a framework to hold me accountable to be the person that I really want to be. And so even today, I remind people, like, be the person in the interview chair. Because the interview chair is the best version of you. Because mm -hmm. what you said in that interview chair was sincere. It was genuine. You meant it came from your core. It came from your every fiber of your being. But the truth of the matter is when we look at behaviors in school today, and that's how I define culture, is just look at how people are behaving. Culture is behavior. It's the behavior that defines your real culture. I don't care what the words on the wall say, right? 
you got a sign behind you that says be kind, right? Right there on your desk. Yeah. Well, that's yeah. great. I don't care what the sign says. I want to see George be kind, right? I want to see when it say kindness matters in a school, I want to see teachers being kind to children. When I see excellence, I want to walk into an office and I want to see excellence. I want it to be a sanctuary of excellence right from the very get-go, right? Because why? Because my core principle reminds me that core principle number three says, carry the banner, create an experience for others that when they walk away, they'll carry the banner for you. Well, that's great, Jimmy, but how am I going to do that? And so it's a framework to help us be the best versions of ourselves. It helps us behave our way back to excellence when we're losing our way. I think we all need an accountability partner. Well, this is like an accountability framework. This is the person I want to mm -hmm. be. And so if I have a framework, it's a constant reminder. Don't tell me, Jimmy. Show me. And that's how I always see it. So culturize is a framework. And I wrote it because I wanted, I had lost my way. And I wanted to be that person in the interview chair. Just like, you know, he asked me what happened to him. Because when I interviewed it, you know, for that position, I want to be great. <laughs> and now yeah. I'm not behaving so great because I'm tired and I'm frustrated. And, and so it really is a shift of the way you think. But um, it's truly a framework for behavior. And uh, I am blessed because I just had actually somebody else reach out to me today. I want to know if they can use my culturized framework for their school's values this year. And mm. they wanted me to ask me, and, uh, you know, many schools have. And it's awesome. It makes me, mm. but I don't care. I, I tell people, hey, I'm not proposing to use culturized framework. I'm saying use a framework. In other words, what is your leadership language? If I go into your school, yeah. what is it you value? In other words, how are the people in your organization going to behave? Don't tell me, show me, but you're going to need something to remind you again, because again, if not, those experiences will make you sometimes start behaving in ways that do not align with what you said when you sat in that interview chair. Well, when you, when you actually said um, you, when you it really tweaked something to me when you said that, you know, you had lost your way. I thought about my own career and a leader that had a human, humongous impact on me, Kelly Wilkins. I mentioned her all the time. and. I think about her and it was weird because I don't think I lost my way. I don't think I ever was really inspired in the first place. Do you know what I mean? Like I, I kind of was like, oh, that's something I remember. I'm not even kidding. I remember an interview and you know how much I love basketball. Uh, one of the guys who interviewed me said, Hey, you know, we're going to hire you. And this is like a small town school. They didn't really have many options. <laughs> I kind of have this concern. You're more interested in coaching basketball than teaching. I'm like, well, that's probably accurate. <laughs> I remember, hey, I'm, not, I'm, not, I remember yeah. saying, I'm like, I'm not going to lie to you. Like I'd much rather coach. And it, and it really, um, you know, really she opened my eyes and it shows you, uh, I remember someone writing that basically schools don't need principles. And this is when I was a principal. So I was, kind of a little bit offended for, on my own part but i was way more offended for kelly because i knew how much a, a really great principle mattered and the thing that i found really interesting and it totally aligns with the work that you do and what you write in your in your books is that i was became kelly's champion as did so many other people mm -hmm. and so many people that were really passionate about education wanted to work for her like right. they went out of their way because they knew she would make them better. And that, that to me was just a really, that, that's the first thing because I don't know if I had lost my way, but I sure found a way when I met Kelly. And that shows you what great leadership does. So I, now, I, watch I love this, George. I don't know if you even see this, but watch how this framework would, would work. And you could see it this way too. The You champion for her, and part of it could be because she also championed yep. for you. But the other thing is, is I believe you did that because core principle number two, I think she modeled for you maybe the type of person you want to be. Number three, I think the way she interacted with you and others, she created ex an experience with you that you then carried her banner. And I also believe that she probably saw something in you and said, hey, listen, regardless of the situation, I think George wants to be great at what he does. And yeah. there's a merchant of hope. And so in some way, there is a framework of behavior within that flow chart that reminds us, like, who are we? Who do we want to be? More importantly, how are we behaving? Because, again, you know, I always say it's just words about words until you actually see it. And yeah. when you see it, it creates, an, uh, it creates an experience for you and maybe even an emotion that moves you and hopefully inspires you to yeah. be the best version of you, right? My goal, really my goal is to have 10% of the impact that she's had. Like, cause that would be an amazing career. Do you know what yeah. I mean? Like that's, that's, that's how, that's how much I, I revere 
uh, her. Okay, so the second question, and this one, I, like someone asked me this about my book, and it's a really hard one to answer, but I, I told you ahead of time, you're like, okay, I got something for this. So yeah. you can go back, Culturize was written in 2017. If there's something you would change about it, knowing all that you do now, and you know, six years later, like what is something that you would, you know, maybe think differently about and, and change? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I get that question all the time too, right, George? It's like we all do. And and the good news is I hope I would change something about it. I hope I change yeah. something about every book I would write because that means I'm growing. I'm evolving. I'm getting better. I'm seeing the world differently. I'm see- My experiences are te- teaching me more, right? I don't think any of us have a monopoly on any of this. I think part of it is at that moment when I was writing, that's who I was, right? And over time, hopefully we continue to evolve. So Definitely, I would continue to to go back. People would say to me, hey, are you going to write like Culturized 2? And I'm like, ah, mm-hmm. I don't really want to write Culturized 2. And I'd say, why is that? What, what, what would you change? I'd always ask them, what would you change? And, and the first thing they always say is, God, I love the four core principles of Culturized. I love that. I love that framework um, we've adopted in our school. I use it in my classroom. I just use it in my everyday life. Uh, Jimmy, I love the stories of it. I like the simplicity of it, right? Yeah. Um, I like the way it makes me feel better about, like it inspires me. But if there's one thing I had to give you advice on, if I had if, if to write it again is, can you add some more things that would be a little bit more practical that would show me how to do it? And I said, well, that's helpful. I appreciate that, right? Like I did. And so I started kind of thinking about that experience in it. But then they t- would say to me, but I love Culturize, right? Don't get me wrong. I still love the book. But if you ask me, that's what I would say. So instead of writing Culturize 2, I said, well, what I'll do is I'll go write a different book. And of course, with the pandemic and everything that was happening, I just felt like, gosh, people are just so beaten down. They're so exhausted. They're giving up. People are leaving the profession. And I thought, you know what we need? We just need to hit the reset button. And just like we do with our phones or just like we do for certain things, I feel like we just need like a recalibration, right? And that's where that idea came from. But then I thought, you know what? I'm going to use this as an opportunity then is if they love Culturize, then I'm going to create a new framework because in Culturize, I don't think I did a very good job. There were actually more than just the four core values. There was four premises that went with it. I just didn't do a very good job of being very clear with that. So I said, I'm going to use this as an opportunity to go clean that up. And I created this idea that I'll create this framework with the four premises uh, from Culturize and turn it to recalibrate. But the first premise is still going to be culturized, right? And that is all about leading from a core set of values. And then in the second one is about building capacity. The third one is about seeing the culture through the eyes of others, because that's what culturized is. I-Z-E is really E-Y-E-S. See the culture through the eyes of others to help you identify those undercurrents that are hurting your morale. And then the last one, George, was those practical things, the processes, Mm -hmm. the frameworks, the protocols. In other words, how do we create a system, Jimmy, of excellence by using your content and your resources and your books? And so that's what I wanted to change more than anything is provide more practicality. And I, I, I'm hoping I was able to do that. At least people have shared with me so far that they love the, the practical things, but they also understand it. It's more clear to them now. Right. And again, I think we just become better writers over time. And, um, you know, when I wrote Culturize, I didn't know what the hell I was doing. I was just following your advice, which is write like yeah. you talk. And I still yeah. write like yeah. I talk. Yeah, but I still write like I talk, but I feel like I'm a little bit better writer because, you know, I've written more, but I still don't like it. It's hard for me to write, you know, because it's grueling and it's um, it's it's hard. I mean, it's hard. It wears on you. It's hard to write a book. You know, and people don't understand how hard it is sometimes. But anyway, that's what I would say is that um, what I tried to do was uh, was to bring a little bit more practicality, a little bit more clarity, uh, but do not give up the core of what Culturize is about. And that is truly it's a framework for how we are going to behave in our organizations. Well, they, I, there's uh, somebody who came, uh, they, I, they saw me speak at an event and they, or it was like at a school district. So I went to another school district and I did almost the same talk, right? Like in, you know, one school district has seen my work and the other one hasn't, but one of the teachers had come there and she said, well, why aren't you doing any new stuff? And I said, I'm like, well, first of all, like, 98 percent of this audience has never seen me speak right so and and i and i get that okay and i so tell me what did you do with the stuff i talked about the first time like what did you do and she's like well i said so you want new stuff but didn't really do anything with the other stuff and i think a lot of times <laughs> like i think a lot of times people and we sometimes are worst enemies in education is that we always want to get the new new thing, the new thing. And I'm like, we got to do some 
again to get really good at the old thing for too. So like when you were telling that mm -hmm. story and you know, I understand the practicality, I know, and I appreciate you sharing that is also sometimes you, people are always craving for new, new, new. I'm like, like, let's, how about you just kind of focus on, are you really doing the old part really well? Right. It's like, don't complain. We're being overwhelmed with initiatives. If you're constantly asking for new initiatives, because yeah. like, I actually think there's, there's, you can be, you can do the same thing you did 10 years ago, but if you do it better, you're still on the cutting edge. That's, that's what I, I kind of look at it. It's not right. like we must move on to a new framework. We must move on to this thing. So just, I think that's something that I want to just share when I was listening to you, because I think sometimes we just want the new. I'm like, you're yeah. not good at the old. Like, get good at the old, right? So, all right. Well, last, George, I've seen you, and oh, I've sorry. seen you speak enough too, right? It's like, it's like what we want our audiences, hopefully. I mean, at least that's how I see it. And I've seen you speak enough. And I feel like I get that from you or whoever is we're listening to speak, people that we respect, people who are doing great yes. work in the field, right? Really, I truly believe helping people and doing it for the right reasons is I do believe that, you know, I try to be really honest and say, people, listen, I, I'm not here to tell you what to do. That's not my job, right? right? Like, I don't even know anything about your community, right? I really don't. Um, I'm honored to be here. I'm grateful. But what I'm really going to try to do is hopefully what I share today, one, I hope it validates what you're already doing. I mean, I hope that some of the things I talk about, you can feel good knowing that, yes, I feel like I'm doing some of the right things, especially for those who maybe sometimes don't get a lot of feedback, but it validates the work. I'm hoping that something I share today reminds you what you're currently doing, but what you like is the little bit how it's a little different and there's a little twist to it or something a little unique that you can now make a little bit of adjustment that maybe will take you to a little bit a, a little bit higher level. I'm also hoping that I share something with you today that you go, oh my God, I hadn't even thought about that. I love that idea. Right. And hopefully you go think about that and reflect on that. But you know what I'm really hoping is that today you're just reminded of the things you already know, but for whatever reason, you're still not doing it or you used to do it and you stopped doing it. And I right. want to reignite that fire in you to go back and go be the person you said you always wanted to be. So again, a lot of it, I think I, I find it somewhere in that arena. Right. And that's kind of what you're talking about. Like, hey, are you doing the things that we talk about? You can tell me about the four core principles of culture, but I'm asking you, what's your framework? Yeah. And are you living your core every day in the classroom or in the building or at the district level? Because if you're not, then why do you want new stuff? Go go get the fundamentals down first. Right. You know, this is a coach. We can go put in all the offenses as we want in the world, but if your fundamentals aren't solid, guess what? It won't matter, will it? You know, will not matter. So I think that's what I love about Culturized Morning. It is truly a foundational framework to set the foundation to say you can do so much more if you get your behavior mm -hmm. right and the way it's supposed to be. In other words, what's your leadership language? More importantly, what's your leadership behavior? What does it look like? Show me. So Yeah, and I know that the, the big thing is, you know, like you're here to, I'm here to share ideas with you, but you got to figure out your solutions because it's your community and you know them best, right? right? So I love that. All right. Last question. So this is written in 2017. It is 2023, you know, and like, you know, I guess it kind of ties into just what we just talked about. Uh, you know, so you're looking at this right now. Why is this book still relevant in 2023, even though it was written six years ago? Yeah, I feel like I kind of, I apologize for that because I feel like I kind of answered that a little bit, but I'll just kind of repeat it one more time is, the reason I think it's more relevant, or it's just as relevant, I should say, yeah. because I still see culture's behavior, right? And when you look at the behavior of people in organization, where is it coming from? And so if you think about it this way, right? Like, like one of the first things I always ask a principal, George, if I'm going to go into work with a principal, I just simply say, let me ask you a question. Just tell me what your vision is for your school, right? Yeah. And part of it is, is because I want people to recognize that that has to be really clear right and so what i see is they kind of hesitate or they kind of stumble over it a little bit or i may ask them at the beginning of the day and i'll turn around the next day and i'll ask them again and they'll sound differently and so one of the things i remind them is hey that has to be really clear because you need to keep reminding people what the vision is all the time right and so if you think about it this way the vision is what do you hope to become someday right the other one is why do you even exist what's your purpose why do you do why do you do what you do right and so to see that but I think the, still as critical, as important as that is, is so talk to me a little bit about what behaviors are going to be required that you and your staff are doing in order to achieve that vision. And so those are the value statements, because to me, values are behaviors. And so how are we going to behave in this organization to achieve that vision? So I think the next step up, George, at least when I work and I notice is that almost, you know, obviously every school is going to have mission statements, vision statements, and value statements. 
but yet you still watch behaviors in the organization that do not align with that. And so I say, let's take it one step further. And so here's where I think you can really move the needle and really take your culture to another level is I want you to think about it this way. Can we predict that right now that George, Jimmy, and everybody else on our staff, do you think there will be days when we don't live our core values that we violate those? Do you think there will be days when we get frustrated or we kind of maybe argue with a kid or maybe come across with a parent with a tone or a little bit more emotion than we should? Do you think that will happen eventually? And the answer is always yes, right? You know why? Because we're not perfect beings. So then the question is this. When that happens, my question is this. How are we going to respond when that happens? So if we can predict that's going to happen, why would we wait for that to happen? And then we walk over here and gossip about it or talk about it, but we really aren't doing about it. So mm -hmm. let's be a little bit more strategic and let's go ahead and work on our values, but let's take another step further. And now let's have the conversation right here before these, they're like the agreements, right? This is how we're, we're all agreeing. We're going to behave this way, but can mm -hmm. we also all agree that we're going to violate these values? Of course we are. Okay. So how do we create a culture permission then that allows all of us to be great that says, Hey, I want George to be great. I want Stephanie to be great, but no one's going to be able to do that on their own. So when George or Stephanie behave in a way that does not align with our values, then how am I going to respond to that? And so if we all agree that the way we would respond is say, hey, George, I get what you're saying, but that doesn't seem like it aligns with our values. Mm -hmm. And so you can go, you know what? I see it. You're right. Okay. And now you say thank you. Because in cultures of permission, it's because everybody wants everybody to be great at what they do. Because I cannot be great unless you want me to be great. And I say that to principals, actually I say, it, well, principals and teachers, but teachers always, George, want to complain to me about their administration at some point. Yeah. And you know what I say to them? Your fourth principal in six years is not the answer, my friend. We are all responsible for the culture and climate of the yes. school. And if you believe you're going to put that on the principal, then you're already done. But it's no different for principals, right? I tell them, if you don't want your superintendent to be great, they're never going to be great because there's no way one superintendent can run an entire district. And so how do we create this culture of permission where everybody wants everybody to be great? So why can't we just say things like, hey, are you doing okay? Hey, I'm worried about you. Hey, what do you need? You don't have to do this job by yourself. Let us help you. And that's the idea of having a leadership language that helps all of us be who we really want to be. And that is, I believe everybody wants to be great at what they do. I think those that aren't behaving that way, like I said, just kind of lost their way. And again, I know there's exceptions to that, but in yeah. general, I truly believe that. And so I think it's all about the, the reason culturize is still relevant today is simply put, it gives us a framework of how we want to behave in our organization. And I'm encouraging every organization to reflect on what is your leadership language? What is your core? And more importantly, are you living that core every day? And what are you doing or how are you responding when people don't live that core? Because you can predict yeah. that's going to happen. You know, the, the first thing I thought when we talked about, you know, wanting your, your principal to be great as a teacher is, uh, you know, you see a principal getting crapped on in a community a superintendent you kept on the community and then people say that's why you get paid the big bucks <laughs> I'm like that doesn't make me feel more better like yeah, it just doesn't. like hey you know what yeah everyone hates you but you get paid more money <laughs> it's right. Like, all right i don't know if that makes me feel better but you know uh like i just i just see that and i think there's a really good opportunity to um always lead up right we want you know you know people is sometimes it's seen as like complimenting or you know, seeing some good behavior from your principal is sucking up. Where I'm like, you, you want, of course, you want them to be great because it, it is reciprocated what happens there. And I would actually, I would actually challenge the sense that I think the book, um, especially over the last few years, is more relevant today than it was when it was first written. And because we, we, I, 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 there's a, there's a lot of talk about like a teacher crisis, education crisis. I just think it's a leadership crisis. Like mm -hmm. to me, it is. Um, a lot of people saying like, you need to be innovative, but exactly this way you should be compliant to everything i say i'm like well <laughs> mm -hmm. it's not really innovative if i tell you exactly how to do it right so yeah. just kind of thinking well, about that remember it george and culturize in the very first chapter it says what is the biggest issue that we're currently facing in education yeah. and when i ask that question i get all sorts of issues everything from state testing to lack of resources yeah. to teacher shortages and i say mm, i don't think so i think it's ineffective leadership i think that's the biggest issue and uh 
and I always try to be really honest and say, hey, but I didn't say ineffective principals or ineffective superintendents. I said ineffective leadership because one of the premises of culturize is that, well, everybody has the capacity to lead. Yeah. And so I put it on all of us. And that's why I always say we're all responsible for the culture and climate of an organization. And to put that on one individual, at least in my experience, that's why those schools struggle because they're, yeah. they live what I call on the perimeter, right? They live on the perimeter. And when you live on the perimeter, you're simply just looking around to who to blame. But the problem with living on the perimeter is that means you're never growing or developing your skill sets because it's never you. You see yep. it as somebody else is the problem, and it's really you. We're, it's we the, are the, the undercurrent, system. right? It's yeah, the we're system. the undercurrent. <laughs> right? That's what, that's what I hear. It's a system. I'm like, well, what is the system made of? Yeah. People. People. Right? That's it's, right. It's people. Yeah. It's people. You are you are the system. So, right. so you have, you have the capability to do this. So, I, hey, man, I really appreciate you taking because we're doing this on yeah. Saturday. I appreciate you doing this. So everyone, thank you so much for listening. Check out, um, you can see links to uh, Jimmy's books in the description down below, uh, his workshop coming up. And we're looking forward to your next book because it's going to be another epic book. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know about that, buddy, but you know, yeah, you do the best uh, thing. Go this music. Hey, everyone, thank you so much for taking the time out of your day to join Jimmy and I. I hope you have a wonderful day. Jimmy, thanks so much for taking the time to join me. Thanks, buddy. God bless. Take care.